minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land of the first men on the moon. We're on internal power with the launch vehicle at this time. Astronauts report it feels good, T-minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour, liftoff on Apollo 11. Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Since October 1968, there have been four previous flights of the Apollo spacecraft. Two of these missions, Apollo 7 and 9, were concerned with Earth orbit proving flights, making certain that all of the Apollo spacecraft systems and the lunar module used for landing men on the moon were functionally perfect. Apollo 8 and Apollo 10 took men around the moon during Christmas 1968 and May 1969. It was the first time that man had left this Earth to circle another world. The names of Borman, Lovell, Anders, and Stafford, Cernan, and Young will never be forgotten as the first men to see the moon at close quarters from 70 miles up in Apollo 8 and down to 9 miles in the lunar module of Apollo 10. 11, this is Houston. You are go for staging. Ralph, we're 10 seconds away from this. Mode 4 capability. Mode 4. Mark, mode 4 capability. Mode 4 on Apollo 11, clicking into orbit using the service propulsion system. PDT is 602 up here. Altitude is 100 miles, downrange 883 miles. PDT is 602, and ignition. And we have a good third stage now. Velocity 23,128 feet per second. Downrange 1,000 miles, altitude 101 miles. D1 is on, num on number 5, if you don't... Know. Apollo 11, this is Houston. At 10 minutes, you are go. And Roger, 11, go. Now, Apollo 11 is in Earth parking orbit, making ready for its journey to the moon, this time to actually land on its surface. The astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins. Since leaving the launch pad, every part of the spacecraft continues to work flawlessly. Fifteen tons of rocket fuel was burnt every second to put them into Earth orbit. The once 363-foot-high, 3,000-ton Apollo Saturn V vehicle is now less than one-third its original length and less than one-seventeenth its original weight. All that remains is the 60-foot third-stage rocket engine, which is attached to the 56-foot 50-ton Apollo spacecraft. Inside Apollo 11, the crew prepare for third-stage burn, a burn that will last for just five and a half minutes, accelerating the spacecraft to Earth escape velocity about 24,250 miles an hour, or 35,530 feet per second, the speed that tears Apollo 11 away from the pull of the Earth's gravity and puts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins on course for the moon. As Apollo 11 reaches Earth escape velocity, the third stage rocket engine is shut down. 
The crew recheck with ground control, confirming that their path to the moon is correct. Then comes an intricate maneuver which is necessary to the whole mission's success. The crew detach the Apollo spacecraft from the third stage engine. Sitting on top of this engine is the lunar module, shrouded by a cylindrical adapter section. Explosive bolts are fired on the adapter and it opens out like an alligator with four jaws, revealing the lunar module. Already separated from the third stage, Apollo does an about turn in space. Its conical nose now faces the exposed lunar module. Slowly, ever so slowly, the spacecraft edges in towards the tunnel docking collar on top of the lunar module. They dock and lock together. Once more, the Apollo spacecraft maneuvers, but this time in reverse, pulling the lunar module away from its adapter shroud and leaving the third stage engine behind. Reignition of the third stage by remote control sends it flying off into space out of collision danger with the now fully assembled Apollo 11. Small reaction motors located on the surface of the spacecraft are fired periodically to rotate it at about one revolution per hour preventing the sun's rays from excessively heating the spacecraft. The astronauts call this the barbecue mode. Now, Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins can relax a little. They put on a TV show for all watching back on Earth. But, uh, we're seeing uh, the uh, center of the uh, Earth as viewed from the spacecraft and uh, the uh, Eastern Pacific Ocean, we have not been able to visually pick up the uh, Hawaiian Island chain, but we can clearly see the western coast of North America, uh, the United States, the San Joaquin Valley, the, the uh, High Sierras, uh, Baja California, and Mexico down uh, as far as Acapulco and uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, and you can see on through Central America to the uh, northern coast of South America, Venezuela and Colombia. I'm not sure you'll be able to see all that. All right, Jenny, we just wanted a very such a weekend when we get the playback, we can sort of correlate what we're seeing. Thank you very much. Uh, Eleven Houston, we see a uh, box full of goodies there, over. By the time Apollo 11 is within 30,000 miles of the moon and some 210,000 miles from the Earth, its speed has dropped to 2,200 miles an hour or 3,250 feet per second. At this point, the spacecraft passes from Earth's gravitational influence to the moon's and Apollo 11 begins to accelerate again. Despite lunar gravitational pull, the spacecraft will not crash on the moon, even if the engines fail. This path was pre-calculated months before, and the craft is in what scientists call a free return trajectory. At about 5,000 miles from the moon, the crew fire the service module engine to counteract the moon's pull. They turn Apollo 11 so that its engine faces the moon to achieve braking action. The craft now goes into lunar orbit. After various checks have been made and the crew have reported and photographed the lunar surface below them, they rest. Roger, Eagle's not gone. Roger, how does it look? Eagle has wings. Roger. Looking good. Roger, Neil. We got a, if you'll give us poo and data, we got the loads for you. Okay, 
You got a food data. Do we have a DOI pad the, and a PDI pad? Over. Docking. The lunar module, codenamed Eagle, with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin aboard, has separated from the mothership Apollo 11. The command module is coded Columbia. The descent to the lunar surface begins. Eagle, we got you now. It's looking good. Over. Hey, Eagle, Houston, that looks good. Eagle, Houston, everything's looking good here. Over. You go to continue power descent. You're a go to continue power descent. 540 feet down at 30, down at 15. Then 400 feet down at 9. Then in 50 feet down at 4. 30, and a half down. They're uh, tight on uh, horizontal velocity. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Dust. 40 feet down two and a half. Breaking up some dust. 30 feet two and a half down. Straight shadow. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Ready? Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward. Dust. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. ACA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Eagle has landed. Those words echo around the Earth. Man has landed on another world. Seems like a very long final phase. Uh, the auto targeting was taking us right into a football field sized uh, football field sized crater uh, with a large number of uh, big boulders and rocks uh, for about a one or two crater diameters around it. And it required us flying down in C-66 and flying manually over the rock field uh, to find a reasonably good area. Roger, we copy. It was beautiful from here. Tranquility, over. Now, we'll get to the details of, uh, of what's around here, but it looks like a collection of just about every variety of uh, shape, angularity, granularity, but every variety of rock you could uh, find. The color is, uh, well, it varies pretty much depending on uh, how you're looking relative to the uh, zero phase point. Uh, there doesn't appear to be too much of a general color at all. However, it looks as though some of the uh, rocks and boulders, of which there are quite a few in the uh, near area, uh, looks as though they're going to have uh, some interesting colors to them, over. Armstrong, the first man to actually step onto the moon, prepares to leave the lunar module. Buzz Aldrin carefully directs him down the ladder. And on his way down, Armstrong pulls a small release ring to open up the mooncraft's instrument compartment. A television camera comes to life and all the world can see Neil Armstrong at the foot of the ladder. The time, 3.56 a.m. British Standard Time, and the date, July the 21st, 1969. Plenty of room to your left. It's a little close on the uh, 
Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, 
Bosley ready to uh, bring down the camera? I'm all ready. I think it's uh, your bow squared away in good shape. Okay. Okay, you'll have to pay out all the LEC, man. It looks like it's coming out nice and evenly. A little time passes and Aldrin joins Armstrong on the lunar surface. They unpack the instrument compartment of their Mooncraft Eagle and set up various instruments on the moon's surface. Now these instruments will automatically respond to such things as moon quakes, solar radiation, temperature, earth laser beams and micrometeor impacts. Information will be automatically transmitted to Earth without the attention of man. The microelectronics industry made all this possible. Without transistor microcircuits, equipment would have been too bulky. Indeed, Apollo would not exist in its present sophisticated form. The lunar module pilot is overcome by the majesty of it all. Lunar pilot, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in, whoever, wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. Over. The President of the United States, Richard Nixon, talks to the astronauts. The most distant telephone call ever made. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made. Uh, I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you do. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. And for people all over the world, I am sure they too join with the in recognizing what an immense feat this is. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this Earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done. And one in our prayers that you will return safely to Earth. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States, but men of peace of all nations and with interest and a curiosity and and with a vision for the future. Uh, honor for us to be able to participate here today. And thank you very much, and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. Armstrong reads a plaque attached to the descent stage of the lunar module. Now this stage remains behind on the moon, serving as a launching pad for the ascent stage. We'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamp. There's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Dear men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. It came in peace for all mankind. It has the, the crew members' signatures and the signature of the President of the United States. Armstrong and Aldrin call up their equally brave and lonely companion, Mike Collins, who is orbiting the moon some 70 miles up. They describe the view before them. Collins has no television to see what millions are witnessing back on Earth. They tell him that soon they'll take off to return to the mothership Columbia. Aldrin enters the moon craft first. Armstrong passes up the precious boxes of moon soil and rocks samples for Earth scientists to analyze. Then with one last look about him, Armstrong rejoins Aldrin inside the lunar module. Outside, 
black void of space is decked with millions of points of bright light. The beckoning stars, the Earth and Sun amongst them, illuminate man's first footprints in the lunar soil. Magnificent desolation describes Aldrin. Hatch close, repressure cabin, detached descent stage, engine ignite, and liftoff. Upwards, ever upwards, unfailingly, the mooncraft takes Armstrong and Aldrin into rendezvous orbit with the mothership, and the mission's complete. Homeward bound, landing safely on the sea of the good planet Earth. 5.50 p.m. BST, July 24th, 1969. Hello, Apollo 11, Houston, how did it go, over? I'll open up the LRL doors, Charlie. Roger, we got you coming home. This, then, is the end of Apollo 11's mission, but only the beginning of man's conquest of space. Yeah.